thing here. I gotta go through my notes real quick here. Um Yeah, I think I, I, I think I did I covered everything I want to talk about. So in short and in closing, I didn't think I was gonna be this long to be honest with you. But uh, I'm feeling better. I'm glad. Thank you for your concerns and your sentiments shared. You need to have a goal. And that goal needs to be realistic. Now, notice that I did not say 50% a month. I didn't say 30% a month. I didn't say 20% a month. I think the upper echelon of consistently profitable and realistic rate of return per month is 10%. As you get higher up in your money, you start using big sizes and large account balances and such. You don't want to increase the rate of return on a short term duration, like a month. You don't want that. You, As you make more money, you want to gradually reduce the level of what you're aiming for, which makes your job easy. You don't ever want to create Olympic size you know, feats that you have to accomplish. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, the Robin's Cup. That's, everybody hears me talk about this stuff, and this is why I tell everybody that if they have shit to talk, you know, go over there and do it. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see you do that. Okay, and they don't ever do it. That's a real competition. It's got real traders in it. A lot of names keep popping up every single year. They may or may not win it, but they place. And I have a lot of respect for that. Every single one of those individuals that start that competition. And here's an experience for you to watch going forward for this year. They haven't updated anything for 2023's results yet. So I'm not sure, you know, when they'll put it up. But the first time they post it, I look at it every single day. And I love studying it throughout the year because you can see the same fo the faces that show up initially in the first month or so, they fade in and out. Sometimes you never see them again. Sometimes they'll fall off and they'll come back. Some of them will fall off and come back and then get really high up there because they're pushing harder than they need to. And everybody, I'm sure, when they first sign up, they just want to win it. And then something happens when they get in there. They feel like they got to do more and more and more and more and more. When Really, they should be just doing what I'm showing you here, doing something consistently over again, over again, over again, and stopping. And if you watch how they, if they draw down, their drawdowns are going to be huge because they're doing everything I said in this discussion tonight. When they have a losing trade, they're trying to correct it right away. They want to put an eraser on that mess up, trying to keep the level of performance at its highest. That's unsustainable. That part of trading is unsustainable. Nobody can sustain the highest equity amounts. I have drawdown. Everybody's going to have drawdown. Okay. If you're going to be trading competitively this year, the worst thing you can do is to believe that you can hold on to your highest threshold of performance. That is, the, that's the pitfall. That's the trap, okay? Every other trader in that competition and, and any other competition like it is gonna be balls to the wall, always going in there trying to do the best they can and trying to fix any errors as soon as they have it. That's where you do it differently. If you get knocked down, stay down for the day. Everybody else is gonna be having those same things happening to them. That losing trade, that drawdown, that one trade turns into three losing trades, and now you're down 5%, 10%. You know, that's completely avoidable. Going to full max loss days, that's completely avoidable. You're not impressing anybody by doing that. In fact, you're doing the opposite. You're showcasing a lack of discipline, and you're showcasing complete recklessness. And if you're trying to be a champion trader you're trying to be a championship contest winning trader your goal is to preserve capital first because the understanding is, is everybody else is going to shit the bed eventually that's what happens every I, you all hear me talk about it and everybody's like you know why do you always talk about it? because it's amazing to study the psychology behind it 
Like you, you leave this as a beautiful illustration of what goes on through a trader's mind. I respect every single one of those individuals that go into that because they're doing it and they're wrestling themselves. That's who's beating them. The other trader that wins the competition, they didn't beat them. They lost to themselves because every single one of those individuals could win. But how they, how do they deal with losing? It's bad enough if you take a losing trade and that sucks. It's not fun. But when you lose and you go back in, you try to fix it and you lose again and it's worse. And now here's the thing. If they see your name on there and they can see how much damage you've done to yourself, the worst thing that can happen is your name show up and then you fall off and never to be seen again. That's shameful as a trader that's, you know, seeking clout or talking shit on the internet. That is a, that, that's something that, you know, no trader wants to feel that. So they're going to try to do what? Race to the top of the mountain, be the first one there, and then they'll take whatever comes after that. And what happens is they'll get up there for, you know, whatever reason that gets them to the highest point on that competition leaderboard. And then they'll see somebody coming up quick. And they might be over leveraging like a nut and getting lucky and being, you know, boom, 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 and big main movement, you know, in the leaderboard. And they think, oh shit, this person's going to lap me. I better start putting some work behind them, you know, getting in there, doing more trades and do more leverage. And, you know, don't use a stop loss because I can't afford to get stopped out. And they start abandoning sound logic, not realizing that if you look at what goes on in that competition, very rarely does anybody come out the gate consistently, not have a lot of drawdown, and just keep chipping away, moving up and up and up and up and up. Nobody, nobody does that. There's never been a year, and I've watched it since 1996, every year. And it's such a fascinating study of human psychology. Like you got to put yourself in these positions that these folks are feeling the pressure of the people underneath them. And sometimes hot shots come in there. And I've watched a couple of them come in and I'm like, damn, he, he's up 500% in one day and then they're gone. Never seen again. But 500%, that's nuts. Like that's a lot in one day. Come on like that, boom, boom, boom. Um, I'm about the busher, this guy's name probably, but I, I apologize if I did. Um, Kevin Stufflebeam, he he was doing really good um, like a year ago, and he had the second highest rate of return on the Robins Cup. And I was tweeting at the time. I was like, you know, hey, look, if you just would just stop, like just just stop, don't do anything more. Like you have it. Like you're the second, the only person above him was Larry Williams. Now there's a huge chasm difference between eleven thousand percent and fourteen hundred percent or just underneath it that that's it you're you're the second highest one and just sit back and watch everybody break themselves trying to get to you that would be fun and i, I would enjoy seeing that because <laughs> i'd be in there laughing with them like i'm watching people come up they get real close to them and then they try to pass them and they break themselves down they're down 30 40 50 percent 100 percent 200 percent and they fall off and they come back again. It's just, it's a fascinating, it's like watching, that's like, that's NASCAR for me. Okay. I, and that's why I like that competition. That's why I always talk about it. And some of you just think I have this morbid curiosity, like I'm in it every year. I've never, ever, ever joined it every single year. I've never done it. 2017 was the only time I got into it. And if you want to believe that I've done it every single year. All you have to do is contact Robbins and say, hey, look, I want to see the results for Michael Huddleston's Robbins returns for this year, this year, this year, this year. And was there money deposited on those accounts? You're going to have a record of me registering in 2018, 2019. But there is at one in 2020 because talking options lady, I, she said she was going to do something. I said, okay, I'm registered. And there it is. And a couple other clowns in the other years. But once I registered, 
they never stepped forward and funded the account. So I'm not going to fund an account. If they're not going to be in it, there's no point of me being in it. But <clears throat> in 2017, and I've said this before, but I like to put it out there because I know people out there talking shit and it ain't real. But I put $5,000 in the Forex division and uh, hooked up a MyFX book to it and everything. And I was being contacted and told that, hey, look, MyFX book is going to link a uh, trade copier service to it and they're going to sell your shit at signals. They're going to make money off you. Oh man, that was the worst thing you could have ever told me. Like, it's exactly what I was like, what the fuck? Fuck you. So I said, watch this. Boom, boom, boom. And I shit the fucking account real quick. Boom. And I talk shit right on it. You can still see it on the MyFX. Uh, what is it? Their, like their website or whatever. I, I was saying, you're my bitches now. Fuck all you. And, and the trolls will say, I'm saying that about my suit. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the people that were linking that shit up, I'm, I'm not letting anybody copy my stuff and sell it. No. So that's that's the storyline everybody runs with that wants to talk shit about me. But nobody's actually going in that Robin's Cup and doing shit about it. You know, it was supposed to be somebody this year. This past it never happened. And somebody's supposed to be in there now waiting, but I ain't seen their full registration or full account number. Because one account has to be done. One account, one account number. There it is. It's simple. I'm going to do what I just told you here. I don't need to be Larry Williams. I just need to be number one. And I can do number one easy as shit. What's so hard about it? Nothing. It's just air and opportunity between us. That's it. Let's go. But talking about it, we're past all that stuff. Making videos and memes about it, we're past all that. Let's just do it. Let's go. We got a whole year ahead of us. And I ain't afraid. I'm not afraid. In fact, I'm actually looking forward to it. I have a lot of fun about doing it. I wouldn't even talk shit about it. I just do it. I don't know. I don't know why everybody makes a big deal about the things I'm teaching you because it works. It works. It can change your life. And you don't need to believe the bullshit that people say. All you gotta do is spend time with me and watch, and you'll see it works. But it's gonna be painful. And expensive because it's going to cause you to do what? You're going to have to let go of the bullshit that you think that makes these markets go up and down. And you're going to have to deal with the repercussions of everybody saying you're in a cult. You're one of those ICT cultists. You think there's an algorithm. You think this, okay. If you think winning consistently, knowing what the market's likely to do better than anybody else is a cult, Okay, I'm in a cult. <laughs> whatever. Call it whatever the fuck you want to call it. I call it winning. Okay, I call it doing it correctly and not having any issues about it. no anxiety attacks about why my system is probably going to fall apart. What settings do I have? What indicators do I have to have? All those problems that traders bring into this equation go away when you take all the bullshit out of it. It's just the price. And if you know that these certain things repeat, Every single day. A stop hunt will occur every fucking day. That's one of the exercises I'm going to put through or put you through this year, starting in February. I'm going to tell you, go through your charts and annotate every single time on a one in five minute chart, how many times a stop run occurred and where it was and what time it occurred. That's a study in itself. By doing that, that's a back testing study. But how's I use that for an entry? By doing that, that gives you targeting and entry perception that you can't see until you do that back study. There's lots of things you can back test and study that has nothing to do with going into the market and supposedly doing an entry pattern. The entry is the least important thing. In your notes, right now for today, January 10th, 2023, write this out in bold letters. The entry technique is the least important factor in consistently profitable trading. Underline it, highlight it. Every single day that you go into your studies, you open your study up with that, you say that like a motto, that's your mantra. The entry pattern is the least significant factor in consistently profitable trading. It doesn't feel like that would be true, is it? It's like you all think I got to know how to get in because I got to have a small stop loss. I got to do two pips because everybody on fucking Instagram is doing two pip stop losses and they're getting 200 R, but they're still trading nano fucking lots three years into it. 
at some point, you got to call bullshit, folks. At some point, there's going to have to be someone that stands up and says, you know, this is a bunch of bullshit. Because if these young men could be doing 200 R trades and using two pip stop losses, let me tell you something. That's better than me. That's better than me. And they would have been picked up by now. <laughs> okay. Trust me, they would have been picked up and there ain't nothing bullshit about that. There's nobody doing that. Nobody's doing that. But you know, everybody believes whatever they want to believe. But once you see the real thing, everything else just feels like a waste of time. And it's a period of mourning you got to go through because for me, I invested a lot of money in books and courses and mentoring through video and VHS tapes and shit. And I believed every single one of these individuals were sincere individuals that were telling me the truth and they're all fucking liars. They're all liars. They're all selling shit because they didn't make money trading. Hmm. That's interesting. I was not charging for a long time. Then I did charge because I was pissed off when people were selling my free stuff. And then to prove that I don't have to do that, I stopped selling. And now I'm teaching more, more fever pitched than anybody else out there, whether they're doing it for free or for money, because I love doing this. This is how I did it before. On Baby Pips, every fucking night I was making a video. I was in the forums typing up all kinds of fucking essays. Because I love doing I have so much in my head, I got to get it out. I have experiences, I have knowledge, I have wisdom. And if I die and I don't share it, I feel like it's wasted. So I'm like a fucking fire hose. How many times am I supposed to stop <laughs> in this discussion? Right. And there's no ad revenue. We're just talking like close friends would. Old high school chums that, hey, man, I ain't seen you in a while. What have you been doing yourself? Oh, I've been doing this. You want to learn how to do it? Oh, yeah, show me how to do it. I wish there was a way we could all connect, you know, physically shake hands and say, hey, but there's some, you know, distances that we're not going to be able to bridge. And we have to do it this way. And it's more efficient this way. And it feels it feels for many of you like one on one, like I'm talking to you when I have my son's and my daughter's face in my mind when I'm talking. And that's why it feels genuine because I'm saying everything to them in this recording that would be said to them if they were here. Much like that movie with Michael Keaton, My Life, where he knew he had. Uh, a terminal illness and he wanted to record all kinds of stuff teaching his son you know because he wouldn't be there you know i i treated my videos like that for my kids not that i'm terminal because i, I mean obviously i'm i was sick today i thought i was dying <laughs> it sucked but i feel much much better now but uh i wish there was a way for us to have a better experience together I've had folks reach out to me and say, hey, look, you know, I want to do an event with you. Everything's funded by us. You know, it would be for profit and we would pay you for your your, your engagement. I just don't want to do that. Like, I, I don't want to do that. Because number one, I'm, I'm probably not going to feel good about the experience doing it. Um, two, you know, the only thing I want to sell in the future is the book. That's it. I don't want to do mentorships and... I don't want the books to be terribly expensive. I want them to be obtainable for all of you. And I want you to know the things that I want you to know. And you'll have it. You know, it's a like a testimony to everything that I've gone through, what I've learned, what I wish I would have done differently as a mentor, and what I've learned as a mentor, as well as, well as uh, you know, real order block theory. What What is this thing that is my order block because what you think you know about it isn't it it's just the the initial introduction to it and there's so many things that you don't know about it that a very big very big book will be the only way i can communicate it. 
And the wonderful thing is, is anybody that hasn't gone through the videos that I've done on YouTube and mentorship core content, the book won't work for them either. <laughs> Everything I've ever done has been calculated and planned and intended to make sure the weak don't get it. The lazy, the short cutters, they're not going to get it. But to appease everyone and also to clear my guilty conscience about making it hard for most people, I'm going to do what I'm going to do this year to make sure you see it real, live, right there in front of you. And while there is a small delay, and it may be a little bit bigger of a delay for other people in different parts of the world, between what I say and what's on my chart on the YouTube live stream, and when you see it on your chart, there's a small little delay in that. If we're looking at one minute charts, that might be a major impact between what I'm calling and talking about and before your chart shows it in the relay from whatever I've done said in the live stream, it's got to travel all around the internet to get to your computer or your device then you're watching and listening to me live. So that delay, you need to be able to compensate for that by having your own real-time data with e-mini S&P and e-mini NASDAQ. If you don't have that, uh, that's going to be a disadvantage for you. And I know some of you are trying not to spend money, but if you're trying not to spend money, but you think you're going to make money in trading, you are already setting yourself up for failure. You're going to have to avail yourself certain resources. And unfortunately, data is essential. Like you, you, you can't rely on like Forex. Okay, Forex is free. It's free data. You know, it's great. But if you're trading a market that's highly precise like this, like you could never pull off. And this is why I've never done. And this is why I've always challenged everybody that say they use one pip and two pip stop losses in Forex and they do it every single trade and it never gets stopped out. I said, just show me one month of doing it. <laughs> They've never done it. They've never done that. You can't do those tight stop losses in Forex because the brokers that you're in, they have their own internal house of liquidity and you're in it. And then they reach out and they get you because you're in order. It's going to trade rate to your price. In the futures market, everybody has the same price. See the difference there? Everybody has the same price. So if you're going to be trading in a professional market setting, you want to be in what? That one. And that means you're going to have to pay a little bit of money to get that feed of real-time data. And it's such an insignificant amount of money. So I know a lot of you are in impoverished nations and you're trying to learn this so you can do better things and, and climb your way out of that. And that's commendable. And I have students have done that. But if I'm not in Forex and my attention is in this market, you're going to have to adapt. Knowing that what I'm doing in this one will work for you in Forex too. I'm just not going to be in Forex. I'm not going to do that. I will tell you my bias. When it's there, I don't have a bias. I didn't share it last night. I just reviewed. Look, we gave you levels. And it traded to them, and dollar did exactly what we were expecting. And how did I use the information? If the dollar was dropping, that means the S and P can go higher. It's a teeter totter effect: one up, other one down. Risk on, risk off. There's going to be times, and you see us doing live streams, and I'll explain how when the dollar is going to be going up, and the S and P will be going up too. Well, what do you do with that? I'll explain all that at the time because it's all short term in nature, and that that break in the correlation is significant when it's there. Much like an SMP divergence. But talking about it conceptually without having it being right there in front of you, it doesn't have the same impact of saying, now watch this one minute candle right here. It should not go above this candle's high, and it's going to go to that candle right down there. And you're all watching on the same one minute chart. And then it happens. And then you're going to be like, what the hell did I just see? And you're going to think about all the shit you read in books and videos and all the other stuff, these indicator things that's always taking your attention away from that. Because here's the thing. 
I looked at these charts when I was working, when I was driving, I had chart books next to me. When I got stopped at a red light and I was delivering my, because I used to do vending, I used to do uh, candy machines and soda machines, coffee machines. That was my job when I was learning how to trade. So I was driving around in a Suzu uh, lift gate truck full of candy and sodas and shit, you know, going around servicing machines all around the Baltimore area. I worked for a company out in Owings Mills that doesn't exist anymore. But uh, I had charts with me constantly. And I lived and breathed this shit. Like, I, I couldn't get enough of it. Clearly, clearly, you can tell still at 50 years old, I am still immersed in this because it is me. Like, this is me. My wife says it all the time. It's like, this this is you. This is like, we're small little pieces and extensions and peripherals to your trading. That's, th th we're the small little extras in the, in the play that is ICT. And unfortunately that sucks as a husband and a dad, but as a trader, it makes me fucking rock hard because I literally, I know what that means. Cause that, that means I'm in it. I'm all in it. My entire life, I've been that way since the 5th of November of 1992 on a Thursday night at 9 p.m. in my aunt and uncle's house reading a book that literally was a roadmap to lose money. But when I lost that money, folks, let me tell you something. That's all it took. That first initial decision. Because I, I sat there and I was afraid to put that first trade on. I was so afraid to go into the futures market, I thought by going into options, that would be safer. Man, was I wrong there? I lost half of my money. Overnight, the first night, orange juice, that shit. By the way, the fellow that sent me the little thing, orange juice, uh, I don't have it sitting on my desk, but I do have it. It was, it was cute. The other stuff you sent me. Yeah, you know who I'm talking about, Mr. Huddleston. <laughs> but, uh, this fear that you probably have when you finally get your funded account, that first trade, the easiest thing you can do is put the smallest leverage on and flip a quarter. If it's heads, just buy something. If it's tails, just sell something and get it out of the way. Once you pop that cherry, not to be crude, but you just got to just do it. You just got to let it happen. Whatever the result is, you've done it because you're going to be so afraid of that first trade and you're going to make it more than it really is. And the longer you wait to do that first engagement, the more psychological impact it's going to have when you do take it. So as soon as you get funded or whenever you open up your live account, the very first trading day, flip a quarter. There it is. In that quarter that you flip, keep it at your trading desk. Because you're going to need that quarter again in the future. When you just feel like you need to have something to distract you from wanting to get out of your trade. Flip that quarter. Stick to the fucking rules. You have to distract yourself because that's what indicators do. Indicators are going to distract you from price. It's going to distract you from looking at what really is going on. Because if you always are looking at indicators, this is why this shit has never been observed by anybody else. Because they have constantly been bombarding us with what? Something to look at, a red herring. Put these triangles over your chart, and we're going to call it harmonic. Ride the Elliott wave. Everything's supply and demand. Like everything else is supply and demand. No, these markets don't work like the fucking grocery store, okay? This is totally different. This is absolutely totally different. In the grocery store, we might be paying a lot more money for things today, but it's not a ruthless cutthroat business like trading is. There's nothing like this. And when you get involved in it, you're either going to fall in love with it and fall head over heels over it. Even if you're not profitably, you're still going to love it. If you feel that way, I'm going to tell you something. You are destined to do well in this. You have the very thing that's needed. That means the passion and the endearment for this industry. Because if you're a casual, just let me just dabble and see what happens. If I make money, great. If I don't, fuck this shit, I'm out of here. 
if you lose money and you feel like this is it, this is the worst thing that could ever happen, this decision you made was the worst thing you could have ever done for yourself, the trading is not for you. Because losing on trades or losing an account for a real trader, that doesn't mean shit. That's just a speed bump. Now, I'm not discounting the fear, the regret, the remorse that you're going to feel if you blow your account. That's real. You have to come to terms with that. And you're going to feel that if you have monthly goals. When you first start out, you're going to think you got to figure it out. You're going to go faster, harder than you really should, sooner than you should. And you're going to have that same experience. Every one of us have had regretting pushing too hard, trying to prove something, and you blow out. Let me tell you something. There ain't no shame in doing that. If you blow out, max loss day, blow your account, major drawdown, go into a tailspin. All of that shit is what we do. That's what this industry, that's the common denominator. You're going to lose eventually, but how much are you going to lose? If you push really hard and you try to do Olympic size feats and you blow the account, does that mean you suck as a trader? No, it just means that you were pushing really, really hard and you went beyond the thresholds that your account and your skill set could afford. Done. Now, that is not how you should be trading every single setup. If you're not in a competition, then why the fuck are you trying to trade like a competition? Try to trade profitably. Be eloquent with your entries. Precision. Manage risk impeccably. That's hallmarks to a highly skilled professional trader. Knowing what they're looking for, engaging it perfectly, managing their stop perfectly, taking partials when it allows it. And if it stops you out and you don't get your target, who gives a shit? You've made money. That's the whole reason why you took the trade, right? I mean, nobody's nobody's in my community saying our targets are the only ones we got to have. Like, when's the last time you watched me do a full pull? I can do them on every single one of my trades. Anything that I execute on, I can do a full pull. A full pull is me new, not taking any partials. But I'm teaching you by example, this is what you want to look for because you're learning. See, you're going to get in trades early, sometimes late. You're going to do the shit wrong. And that's all part of this. It's all normal for you to do that and fail. That's normal. Everybody does this. And you learn from those experiences. You don't learn from making money. You'd never learn from making money. The only thing that shit does is make you more hopped up to do it again, quicker than, than you should. You're going you're to rush back in. And the lesson comes from you not doing what you feel like you need to do when you make money, which is go back in right away because that dopamine hit, it wears off fast. Especially as soon as you take your win to the social media and nobody gives a flying fuck, you're going to feel like, oh, it wasn't big enough. Let me go in and do more. I got to do... I got to do 500 contracts of the E-mini S&P or US 500 because then they'll pay attention to me then. ICT will like my post if I'm using a million dollar leverage in my pound dollar trade. If you're using unrealistic expectations in your trades and you're using exorbitant leverage, it's chances are I'm not going to like your post. And I'm doing that to show you be a little bit more humble. OK, because you're not trading with that kind of leverage. So don't do that. I'm not impressed with those demo profits. I'm impressed with the person that shows precision. Their stop loss is there. They're recording their entry and exit. I love that. And my students do that. I don't like the screenshots of the fake arrows and the typed out how many contracts you're getting. You can tell you when you do it. I can see it. If I can see it, I know everybody else can see it. I'm not going to co-sign fraud. And some of you want to see me like your post. So that way it makes you feel good that your dopamine hit. Instead of doing the work, seeing it pan out in your own charts, you won't need me to like your post. You won't need me to you know, reply to your post. And I appreciate all that adoration, but it's needless. I'm not a fucking king, okay? I'm not a goat. I'm just a 50-year-old dude that has worked his ass off, and I couldn't do it until... 
I was blessed with it. And I'm doing my part to keep it up. So don't make me more than I really am. But you have to be realistic when you do it. Don't be fake about any of it. If you lost trying to do something, be honest and share it with the community. But don't talk in defeated language. Oh, I blew it again. I'm so fucking stupid. That right there, you're anchoring that bad moment with negativity. And you're going to be fearful of that same result the next time you do the same thing you just did. And you might not get the same result, but you'll be fearful of it. And you won't do it. And then it pans out. And then, then how you feel. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. When I do it, I lose. And when I'm ready to do it again, I should do it, but I won't do it. And then it makes a win. And then you're going to flip flop back and forth feeling like, I don't know what I'm doing. When you have to press into that uncertainty. Trading is a professional loser's game. Every fucking trade that we enter, they're all losers from the start. You got to cover the costs. You got to cover the dealing spread in Forex. Every single one of us has to manage a losing trade right from the jump. Some of us manage them better than others. And you have to remind yourself that you're the only one at the helm. I can't fix the shit when you do it wrong. When you steer into a tree, you done wrecked your shit. Like, I can't fix that. And you have to live with it. You got to come back from that and know that, hey, you're in good company. I've fucking blown lots of accounts as a young man. I've done that. That's normal shit. Even when I was in my 30s, I've set accounts up and I had my own algorithms where it would put orders in and I was testing high frequency trading and I set them up, let it go. And then boom, 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 boom. inside of one hour, the account's gone because the settings would be off and I'm pushing it full board. Bang, 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 bang. I'm not doing the trading. My program's doing it and boom, 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 it's done. Well. I take that data and I say, okay, what did it do wrong? What do I have to fix and debug it? Now, if someone looked at that and said, oh, look at this. He put his account together, sat there for two weeks, first day out the gate, boom, shot himself in the ass. Looking at it, I'll relate that. It was like, this guy took that many trades and the whole fucking account roasted in one day, not knowing that what I was doing was, I'm number one, I'm setting all my parameters up to see what I can do. And it wasn't a lot of money, but outwardly looking at that, it'd be like, oh, that's failure. That's a person doesn't know. I'm trying to automate something. And that failure shows you what you need to adjust and what you need to fix. So there's a lot of ignorance in this industry, especially from people that are just coming in. They don't even know how to fucking trade, but they're going to give somebody, a, they're going to give an opinion about somebody else. You don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. You have never taken a trade in your life. And you're going to criticize other people and me? Fuck off. Get out of here. You have no idea, you have no idea what you're doing. You have no clue what the fuck you're talking about. And you have no business giving your criticism about anyone. You're still working a job. You've never been profitable. You can't even find a setup. But you got all this criticism about every, everyone else. That's who some of you are listening to. And you let that shit get into your head. And that's taking precedence over learning. Because if you spend time doing this, you'll see that everything else that anybody's chatting about, it's all bullshit. You're in the right place at the right time with the right person. I'm not going to hand you a bill with a credit card, swipe your this and give me your PayPal that. All this is, is you show up, you put the work in, learn. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be fucking hard because you're wrestling yourself. But once you finally get past yourself and get out of your own fucking way, then you'll really start to learn. And you'll see that you've made it much more harder than it needs to be because it's all basically psychological. You're afraid of losing money. You're afraid of being wrong. You're afraid of failing. You're afraid of your fucking spouse or your coworkers or your family members, your friends to say, yeah, I told you it wasn't going to work. It's all a pipe dream. And some of you deep down inside, listen, folks, listen. It's going to get so hard that you're going to actually create the environment for that to happen. So that way it's ending all the pain. 
that short little momentary embarrassment around your family, family and friends, your coworkers. Yeah, I lost my fucking money. You're right. It's fucking bullshit. Nobody's making money. It's all fucking fraud. It's a scam. It's all horseshit. Because you don't want to endure. Because it's hard wrestling with that feeling of, you know, what would they think of me if I fail? Fuck that. Why are you even entertaining that shit? Listen, failure is a fucking choice. That's not a guarantee. Failure is a fucking choice. Setbacks, speed bumps, adversities, that's all part of this. Like anything else, anything worth doing is going to be fucking hard. It's going to cost money. It's going to cost time. It's going to cause you to have to put more effort into this than in you ever think anything you've ever done. Weak people don't survive in this industry. Unorganized, undisciplined, irresponsible motherfuckers do not stay in this business. You have to be an adult that is an independent thinker that understands there's real risk in this shit. You can lose your ass. You can have more money taken from you than you have. How's that possible? Get into a move where your stop loss doesn't get respected like a CPI number and it full on margin calls your ass. Now you're underneath where you had in the account. It's gone. The broker's going to want that money. I've had margin calls like that. It's embarrassing the first time. But you're like, oh, fuck it. You know, <laughs> the broker says, look, you know, you're going to be able to meet this margin call today. Now I'm going to need to get to you on Monday. But okay. And then they're calling your ass at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, you going to take care of this margin call. Yep. Wire's on its way. Scratch yourself. Okay, it's bad. Blow your leg off. It sucks. You got to get a prosthetic. Okay. If you're going to be in trading, you got to find a way to work around it. You're going to hurt yourself in this industry. You're going to. Everybody does it. No one's walked in this and went through without any scars. We all have. If you're here still... And you finally made it point to profitability. You all have these same war stories. Some of them are much more interesting than others. But largely, most of the things that you're putting yourself through are completely avoidable. Because you're looking for too big of a return, too fast. You want to flip your accounts. You see all these fuckers on YouTube. Yeah, I flip my account this way and I flip my account that way. I've done this and I've done that. And they're only showing you an MT4 list of trades. No, no engagement, no management, none of that stuff. And you fall victim to that because you see everybody else saying shit in their comment section. Oh, you're the goat. You're a trading god. This is godlike trading. That's nonsense. And you don't ever want to be caught up in any of that. If you, uh, if, I'm going to say this. If you read the comments on my YouTube video, it's a sugar fest. And you now understand why I did not have those comment sections open. Because all of that stuff, while I love it, I feels good as a mentor seeing it. It's needless. It's it's really not needed at all. And I can see how easily someone that would be slated against me would see that and say, oh, yeah. This is all, you know, him sock puppeting. <laughs> That's a lot of people in it. But you don't need to do that. And don't let that opinion by other people saying that they like or support what I do. Don't let that shape your opinion of me. Don't because you see other people saying, oh, ICT is the greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, he's the goat. I'm not the fucking goat. OK, I can't stand that. But don't let other people influence you thinking I'm better than I am because you see other people saying that I am. I want you to come here and taste and see it yourself. And if I don't live up to what you think I've said, then you say it. And bring it and show all the receipts where I said this live and it didn't happen. That I showed an example and explained what I was going to do and then did it. And it wasn't in the teachings. I challenge everybody all the time. Genuinely. If you think what I'm teaching is horseshit, go through the content, 
And I made it even shorter with the 2022 content. Go through the charts and see if that doesn't pan out. See if you can't make money with that. Shoot holes and do it. Listen, every time I'm trolled, if it's a really good troll or someone's you know ribbing me about something, if it's noteworthy, I'll, it'll many times like this whole discussion tonight, it'll cause me to think about something and then I'm like, okay, I can turn this into a lecture. I'm going to get this off my chest at the same time. And then there it is. So some of my higher end trolls know how to get me to produce more content because they know if they say certain shit, I'll be triggered because I'm like a dog chasing cars. I, I can't help it because <laughs> I know in, invariably a lot of you that are new or just, you know, you'll believe any fucking thing that anybody says negative about anybody else because it just seems like that's what should be believed and never even seen it yourself. Never even came through and did the work and, and tested it or spent time with me where I'm actually calling it before it happens. With precision, that's the part that defies all logic. If it was something retail, it wouldn't be that precise because I've never seen anything in retail that's as precise as what I got. And that's that I was looking for this when I first started because I was buying every book out there thinking, okay, the RSI divergence with a 14 period is going to be the clue for me to get the highest candle. If I could just learn how to sell the highest candle, then that's it. I'm going to, I'll be profitable. Listen to what I was thinking about as a 20 year old. I was demanding and only accepting being short on the highest candle. So what was I missing by only pursuing that? Any chance of ever seeing or recognizing a fair value gap or a breaker. Oh, shit. And that's how you fell victim like everybody else does. Indicators are a distraction taking you away from open, high, low, and close. I'm convinced that if people would have studied price action long enough without all the other bullshit, patterns for pattern's sake would have been a bigger thing. And that was one of the reasons why I liked uh, Linda Rashk and Larry Connor's book, uh, street smarts and i'd still believe that that book should be in everybody's library there's a lot of stuff in there that i think is this filler you know they they would probably argue and say well i've made this much money with it michael you can fuck yourself and that's fine that's great i'm just saying that there's some patterns in there and some things that they talk about this they're not terribly exciting to me you know i like the anti-pattern because you know, it kind of made sense because it still had a little bit of a hook to the um, stochastic type thing and I was a big fan of Stochastic at the time when that book came out. But I've had affinity for the turtle suit pattern. And while I don't teach and trade their version of it, it helped me understand the logic of how the market runs for stops. And I, I've, I had to wrestle with this statement that Larry Williams made in one of his lectures on video. He said, you know, there's these people, and I, when I played it for my son, we were in our theater about a couple weeks ago, and I said this in the last time I did a, a Twitter space mentioning it. I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna close it. But uh, there's a part in the video where he says, you know, they, I've been doing this a long time, and you hear these people, they, you know, they got me, you know, those guys got me, they, they, those guys did it to us guys. That's how he says it in the, in the discussion. Referring to, you know, someone stopping you out and he doesn't believe at least through his material he promotes the idea and i'm referring to larry williams right now um, he promotes the idea that there is no collective entity of someone out there pursuantly going after your stop loss when i'm absolutely 100 percent privy to the group that does that <laughs> so here's the here's the problem with that if you learn from that as a young impressionable 20 year old like i was and then everything i was seeing and made me feel like i was on the right path but my hero larry williams at the time and i have all the respect in the world for this man still i'm honest in telling you that him saying that remark was a hindrance for me when i had it figured out in my second and a half to third year, that remark by him fucked me all up because I looked at him as a 
well, like a father figure because I didn't have my dad and my grandfather was gone. So I was you know, looking to latch onto a father figure and this shit's hard, man. And you have so many advantages today with the technology. And look at what I'm doing. I'm fucking still bloviating on about shit. You know, you probably some of you probably already fucking left the you know the conversation and then went to sleep or whatever you're doing. And I don't give a shit. If there's one of you listening, it's, that's all I need. Just give me an audience of one. <laughs> and I'll talk and talk and talk. But this remark by Larry Williams saying that, you know, he didn't believe there was this them guys did it to us guys. You know, somebody stopped us out. And because I had so much respect for him and I believed everything that came out of his fucking mouth and anything he had printed, like I was the fanboy of fanboys. Like you could have never said anything negative about that man. And I would have fucking wanted to backhand your ass. Like this guy did it. Like he did it. Now, if you look into his personal life, you know, they, they went after him for tax evasion. You know, they picked him up on the airplane going to, uh, or leaving Australia or going to Australia or something to that effect. And he did some time in jail for all that bullshit. And I mean, there's all kinds of fucking shit that, you know, are run around him. And honestly, I think it's because, you know, he beat their ass. Like him or not, he whooped their ass. And they don't want people coming out there feeling like they can whoop that ass. So that's the reason why I always stay in demo. You know, I, I, I'm standing out here showing you things. But I'm also cognizant to the effect that there would be a different treatment of me if I go out there and start running up in front of everybody and you you all get to come on my coattails. Okay. I'm nervous many times when I talk about certain topics. And I don't like some of the things I've said in some of these Twitter spaces when I when I go off the rails and I say more than I want to say. Um I can't retract it. I can't pull it back. Part of me feels like it's therapy because I get to get it off my chest. But I'm also aware of, you know, who I learned from. And I don't want to cause any of that kind of static. So I I live in that realm where somebody can look at me and say, oh, he's a demo clown. He's a demo baller. Just that, you know, and then it's fine. You know, I, t I coined the term demo baller. That's me. I, I, I did it so that way I can stand right there in front of everybody in plain sight, hidden, where only people that would want to learn how this stuff works would give me their ear in time. And they're rewarded for that. But everybody else casually look at me and say, oh, well, fuck him. You know, he's playing around with demo accounts. Great. Perfect camouflage. Perfect. And I've been out here doing it. Just like this. And people have looked past that mask and saying, oh, shit, there's really something there. And that's what I enjoy. I like doing that. But Larry Williams was a huge hindrance to me because his words saying that he didn't believe that there was a an entity out there. Oh, shit. I had to make sure my phone was still on. I was hitting the wrong button. I thought I had lost my battery. Hold on one second. Because his belief in the stop hunt part of this industry, he said that he didn't have that view. And his excuse for that position was because he sold the high of this market or did this and that. And he'd come back with, if you get stopped out, your, your, your stop loss is in the wrong place. Okay. Okay. I admit your stop loss is in the wrong place if you get stopped out. That's that's a given. But that doesn't change the fact that there is somebody out there collectively aiming for your shit. You don't think that's happening? Because that's exactly what I'm teaching you to do. You're targeting retail stop losses. If you're learning as my student, that's exactly what the fuck I'm doing. And that's what these young men and women are doing right now when they're making money, whether they're live accounts or they're funded accounts. When they're banking and getting real money, when that money's going from the brokerage firm into their fucking bank accounts. That's happening because they're going after stop losses, Mr. Williams. And that's just the bottom fucking line. So if you've had that thought process all this time, it's time to reassess things because it's really going on. It's absolutely going on. And one of the things I, 
made me angry. And there was a period of time where I, I was like, fuck Larry Williams. Okay. And I, I've changed my tune because obviously I was a young man being stupid. But I was offended by, you know, when I finally realized that I've postponed my level of understanding about the marketplace. If I would have just simply discounted him and his opinion instead of elevating it, okay? And why am I even saying this? Because I know I have profitable students that have done things with other approaches. You know, these people are making money. They've made money. And they came to me and they hear how hardline I am about certain things. Well, I'm hardline about every fucking thing. I'm polarizing about everything. I have my opinion. Everybody else is fucking wrong. That's just the way I am. I'm, it's a one way street with me and they name them. They, they name roads after me one way. I'm not here for friends. You're here to listen to my opinion, whether you like it or not. I don't give a fuck. OK, but if you want to learn how to do this, this is the way I teach it. And sometimes I'm not the best mentor for it. In fact, I'm probably not the best mentor, but I I have logic and I have things that make perfect sense. If you just take everything else away and just go back to the conversation of what we're talking about, how do these markets work, how do they book, what makes them gyrate and what's the real general principle, what causes the price fluctuations and repricing? Why does the market go up? Why does the market go down? It has nothing to do with buy and selling pressure. It's the fucking liquidity. It's where the money is. The money is the orders. Where are those orders going to be resting? Above old highs and below old lows. How hard is that? It's not fucking hard. It's not complicated. Now, what, what complicates it is I have so many approaches to attack that liquidity. And lazy fucks out there simply want a one-trick pony approach that they don't have to fucking think about. They want to pop up a yin and yang symbol on their fucking chart, and then they got to just do something based on that. Give me something to understand why I'm doing it. Don't just give me a stop sign or a green light go. Fuck that. Give me something to trust. I don't want to be like a laboratory rat where the, the, the bell would ring and the rat knows to go down this way, this way, this way, and they can get its cheese. Fuck that. I don't want to be manipulated in any aspect. I want to know why I'm doing something. I know why it's supposed to be happening. And when it's wrong, I accept the fact that I did it wrong. I'm not going to argue about it. I'm not going to be fucking mad about the system falling apart. I'm going to trust that it will work again in the future when I'm right doing it. See the difference there? There's personal responsibility that's lacking in all of the fuckery that's going on in this industry. And it's been that way since I've been in it and longer. I came up in the 90s when this shit was hot and heavy, when everybody started realizing, hey, I could start marketing shit. I could sell books. I can sell courses. And I didn't know how to do any of that shit. I was learning. I was buying everybody's bullshit. And everybody learned from the 90s, oh, shit, there's a market for this. And in the 2000s, it exploded. Remember infomercials? That's when that shit happened. Because everybody feel, feel like, well, feel like, <laughs> felt like they could go in there and provide a service or a way of doing something to everybody. And if you could put an infomercial up, here's a test for some of y'all older folks. Do you remember a guy named Don LaPree? I take tiny classified ads and I place them in thousands of newspapers all around the world. If I can get a newspaper to pay me $35 or, or profit from that, I'm a thousand newspapers. I'm making $35,000 a week, every week, week after week, I'm getting checks. Okay. But he's not telling you the fucking cost of doing that is break even. So I, I heard this shit as a young man, and I said, oh, shit, this is the fucking ticket. I'm getting out of this fucking bending job. I'm going to do that. So I bought his bullshit, and it was literally a rag. Like it was like a comic strip on the back of a fucking newspaper. It was worthless. He gave you a directory of everything that – Every newspaper and phone number that you, know, you can post an ad with. You could get that shit on the internet. The internet was around then. But what he got me was the upsell. The upsell was, okay, because you are now a member of my private community, I'm going to let you in on an exclusive deal. one 900 numbers. Yeah. I had one on, I had one 900 numbers. I had a betting channel. I had a horoscope channel. I had a dating service line, all that shit. Okay. I had all that stuff. And you know how much money I made off of it? About $8,000. That's it. He made more money than I did. I got one minute 
one I'm sorry, one dollar per minute for every call that was made, and he had a dollar fifty of it. Now I had to do the advertising, but he made more money off of it. Long story short, he ended up getting arrested for some bullshit, and he, he cut his own fucking throat in the jail cell. That's Don Lapree. So I've done that shit too. Um, I sold a book for handicapping uh, horse races, and the only thing I did was I literally, as a young man, I was a teenager, I went to the library in Essex and looked up handicapping horse races. And I took a book, and I condensed it down to 15 pages, and I put it in the city paper. And I sold it for $19. And I was making more money than I was making when I was working as a fast food guy. So I said, fuck this. I'm not working. And I did that for about three years. And I only put the ads in The Avenue, which is a little shit rag uh, newspaper on Thursday that came out. And I ran on the city paper. Making money handicapping horse races. And it was something I just simply condensed. and. There it was. But gamblers, okay, gamblers are sick individuals. And I didn't realize that at the time. I just figured, well, shit, I'm going to sell something. Because what? I see these people that I was working for, they had a mail order business. And they literally were selling things all around the world. All kinds of shit. And I'm like, wow, you know, I, want, I want to start doing that. And I talked to one of their nephews. And I said, listen, you know, if you were going to do this, what would you do? And I don't know. I just like what I'm doing now. You know, I just got to sit back and get the money. I said, yeah, but I don't have that. How can I, how can I start something? If you were doing it, what would you sell? He goes, I don't know. I'd probably sell like a book or something. I said, yeah, but what would sell? And here's the things that sell. Making money and sex. Anything making money sells, number one. But the only thing that outperforms that is anything sexual. That's pornography. I never was in, interested in that. And his family was into that industry. They owned a, a theater on, on Bel Air Road or Harford. I can't remember if it's Harford Road or Bel Air Road. And then uh, they did a lot of the, you know, the adult novelty stuff, mail order stuff. And man, I literally, when I walked in and I saw their dining room table. And they had mountains of fucking money falling off on the floor, falling off on the floor. And this man's wife came in the room and her wedding ring looked like a blue ice cube. The diamond was blue. It was huge, fucking enormous. It was so ridiculous looking. I was nervous. I was like, I'm in the wrong fucking place. I didn't want to move. I was afraid if I if I made a movement, even looking like I was getting close to that money, they'd probably bust me in the head, like, you know, going to try to steal none of this shit. Like, I was nervous. I've never been around that kind of money before. So I'm thinking, okay, they clearly know what the fuck they're doing. So I was asking his nephew, I was like, hey, you know, what would you do? And he's like, sell a book. And I was like, okay, well, what sells? And he said, making money or sex. I said, well, I'm not doing anything sex. I, I just, I've never, never been into that shit. So I was like, okay, well, what makes money? Lottery numbers. Everybody had a thing for lottery numbers. And I was like, oh, fuck that. If I knew how to win the lottery, I'd just win the lottery. And I was like, what, what do people bet on? Horse races. I knew nothing about fucking horses. I knew nothing about racing horses. And my grandmother had horses, and I rode them on the weekends when I'd come up there. But <clears throat> apart from that, I didn't know anything about horses. So I went to the library, and I saw a book. And I picked it up, I read it. And I was like, okay, I now understand what horses horse racing is about and how you handicap racing and stuff. So I condensed it down to like 15 pages. And I drew the own my own picture of the, the horse in the front being ridden by a jockey. And there it was. I sold it right on uh, City Paper and the Avenue. And I only made the copies that were purchased. Mail order, you know, money horse would come in. I didn't have to do any kind of, you know, MasterCard, Visa card, nothing like that shit. And sometimes it would be cash. There it is. It's done. <laughs> so that was the beginning stages of Entrepreneur Huddleston. But I have no idea how the fuck we got on this conversation. But back to Larry Williams. <laughs> that influence he had on me that was a negative influence. That negative influence of me listening to him and holding his opinion in high regard was detrimental to my development. And by having 
a profitable approach coming to me and then you hear me say everything else is stupid that you have to understand something that's my opinion i was scarred by all that shit i couldn't make it work like i make this work so i am highly opinionated I am absolutely convinced that no one could make me see anything other than what I see now in price because, well, you see the the results of it. It's precise. But I don't want you, much like watching other people leave positive comments about me and negative comments, don't let any of that influence or form your opinion about what it is you're learning or your experience with me. Have that experience uniquely independent from everybody else's input. And that way, you can't blame the results on anything except for the content either works or it doesn't, or you're lazy, because that's the only outcomes. If you're not lazy, you will make this work for you. You can't deny it. It's the truth. It's the absolute market. But you have to come to grips with, there are things that you're going to encounter in this industry that are taboo. There is no stock hunts. There is no them that are going to get you. And a lot of the old timers and Larry Williams is old time. Like he's been at it longer than I have. He's been doing it 50 years. I've been doing it 30 and he's done, you know, wrote all kinds of books and you made a name for himself as an educator and such. And he's highly regarded. And I regard him. He's like, he was my first mentor, but he making that remark as much as he believed in it had a huge fucking negative impact on me. And I wrestled with, I know in my heart of hearts that he's wrong. But because I looked at him as a mentor, father figure, young, impressionable Huddleston, I didn't want to admit in my heart of hearts that he was wrong. He was wrong. Absolutely fucking wrong. Okay. So instead of just going through the process of saying, okay, let me just suspend my belief in what he believes and agreeing with it. And let me go just test this on my own. I put it off. And I knew, and I have it in my journals. I'm wrestling with this right now. I just wish he never would have said that. And by me saying that in my journal, what did I just do? I reinforced the negative control and power of that statement he made. They're his fucking words. That's all they are. They're words. Some of you get offended because I'm dropping the F-bomb. You're supposed to be a Christian. It's a fucking word, okay? It's just a word. I'm emphasizing something. I am not calling you out of your name. I'm ferociously trying to communicate the level of passion I have behind what I'm saying. If it's ugly language, look past it. Just understand I'm talking to you because I want you to do well. I'm not trying to offend any of you. I'm not trying to be Mr. Perfect Christian because there is none of them. They don't exist. But I'm trying to communicate the understanding that other people's opinion about me or anyone else, good or bad, don't elevate that shit to a level where you adopt it and you haven't done the work yourself to evaluate whether or not their opinion of whatever it is they're talking about is even valid. I had that problem in my own development. And when I journaled it multiple times, I would literally start off my journal sometimes saying, I'm still wrestling with Larry Williams saying that he doesn't believe there's a stock hunt. When I'm looking at this shit and I just got stopped out on soybeans, it went right to my fucking order. It didn't go one tick beyond. It went right to mine and the fucking, that was the low of the day and it went up. Limit up the next two days. And you're going to tell me there ain't no fucking people out there taking stops. (laughs) Come on, man. Got to call bullshit eventually. So there's a, There's a spectrum to this. If you're coming to me new, if you've been here for a while, or if you're a profitable uh, trader doing other things, you're going to hear me say things that are highly opinionated. And I don't want you to take anything I say that is an opinion about other styles, other approaches to trading. I'm not oblivious to the fact that there's other people out there literally making money And they have no idea what the fucking order block is. They have no idea what a fair value gap is. They have no idea about any of this shit I'm teaching you. And yet they're profitable. I'm aware of that. But I have to be me. 
And I'm sure when Larry Williams said he what he said, he had well-meaning intentions as as the, the encourage his students like he was initially dealing with me. I was like, OK, so no one's going to get my stop loss because as soon as I understood what he was teaching, a stop loss order was going to protect me from losing more money, but I'm going to lose money. Fuck that. I don't want to put that in there because if I'm doing this, I should be right. That's what the, that's what you're expecting to learn in, as a trader, right? Everybody comes to that conclusion when they first come here. Not just to me, to anybody trying to learn how to trade. When you buy a book, you're thinking, okay, he's going to teach me how to not take loss. You're going to teach me how to never take a losing trade. Nobody has that. Nobody has that book. Nobody has that course. Nobody has that mentorship. Nobody has that secret technique. You're going to trade with my concepts. You're going to have losing trades and you're going to have winning trades like anything else. The difference is when you are wrong here, you're not going to be going back and trying to form fit what setting on your indicator would have avoided that. You fucking lost. Next. Next trade. It doesn't mean anything's broken. It just means you had a human error. You did something wrong. Own it. Take full responsibility for it. You've had money management behind the trade properly. It did not crush your account. It did not make you nuts because you had a, a, a losing transaction. It just means, guess what? You got a flat tire. It sucks. Suck it up. Get on the road again. It's as simple as that. But you're going to make it bigger than it really is because you're bringing in what? Preconceived notions to, hey, every trader that makes money never loses. That's how I went into this. Because I looked at what Larry Williams did being promoted back then. Oh, shit. He took $10,000 to $1.2 million in, in one year. And then when I found that he was over $2 million at his equity high, that was it. Nobody could have told me anything bad about him then. And here's the thing. He lost more than half of that equity high. And I didn't even see it like that. I held on to the fact that he got it up to $2.2 .2 million. Hey, he did 2.2 million. He didn't go home with 2.2 million. He got there though. Now, as a trader looking back now, more mature, I can appreciate the fact that he went from 2.2 .2 down to 700,000 and back up to 1.2. But at the time, as a young man, it completely went over my head that he was at 2.2 .2 and lost all the way down to 700,000. That, to me, is much more impressive to, to come back from that drawdown and still come out with 1.2. But the fact that in my infancy, not even recognizing that level of drawdown, like I didn't want to see it as a bad thing. And that's why I don't want you all to refer to me as the greatest of all time, the goat, the king. Number one, that builds an expectation that's unrealistic. Because I am not infallible. I do do things incorrect. I do sometimes not do it right. And that doesn't mean that you can't learn from me. It doesn't mean that these concepts don't work. It just means that I am human. I have a lot of things that go against me. And you get to hear these character flaws when I'm doing these live streams and well, Twitter spaces where there's no filter with me. And you literally hear and experience the mood swings that I go through. And these are, well, they're not even at the extreme. Like there's times where I'm swinging crazily and I can't control it. Bipolarism is very difficult to live with. And it's really hard for the people around you. And trading with it and teaching with it, it, it to me, I'm... I'm astonished that I'm effective at all because I know how it's hard for me to listen to certain people. And I know how I can really like to listen to certain individuals, but they have nothing to offer. And then there's some people that you'll listen to that you really can resonate with. And you can just like listening to them. And I know I'm not the cup of tea for some of you. And I, I wish I could fix it, but I can't. And just try to take me out of that. I'm just a conduit. Go to the content, study it, take what you need to make yourself better with it, and just you know keep me abreast as what you do with it. That's all I'm asking for. I'm interested to see what you do with my life's work. That's all. And 
already you can see some people already you know are doing amazing things and to me and my family we were actively interested in seeing what all of you do with it this year i believe will be a monumental experience for all of you it will be for me because you know i'm i'm trying to do everything i can but i'm not short on uh, realistic expectations, knowing that I will still meet with failure in some of you. I won't connect the dots for some of you. And if that happens, my in, my last request would be for you to give it some time, take, a, take some time away from it and come back to it later on and see if it doesn't do it for you then. But at least try to be there when we're doing the live sessions because you'll see it and you'll hear me talk about it and I'll explain what I'm seeing and what it should do and what it shouldn't do. And don't discount the fact that it's on a one in five minute chart because everything I'm talking about is the same thing every time frame is going to do. When you see what I'm referring to, it'll make much more sense when you start back testing and looking at old data. It'll be. It'll literally leap off the chart at you and it'll feel like you ever seen a stereogram. If you've never seen a stereogram, some, some, some people can't see a stereogram. Um, wh what it is, is if you look at a, a picture and it's usually made with like dots or some kind of um, pattern. And if you look at it casually, it just looks like, okay, well, there's nothing to that. But if you let your eyes relax, almost feel like you're crossing, there's a three dimensional image that'll come to view. And when you have the experience of once you understand what I'm teaching you, you'll look at the charts and they'll be just like that experience the first time you see a stereogram. And I'm probably some of you right now if you're Googling, what is a stereogram? <laughs> if you've never had that experience of seeing one, it's really neat. It's and some of them are are pretty lame once you finally see what they're what they're hiding, but they'll draw like a picture of a horse, there'll be an image of a horse or a fish, or it could be a word or whatever. Something's hidden inside that picture. And when you finally see price for what it is, on the days it's going to do certain things, like for instance, the other day, not yesterday, like well, not the day we just finished, but the previous day, where I gave you every level for the day and it ran up, closed in the six, uh, 60 minute fair value gap, broke down, went back to the opening gap and down into the fair value gap that shaded in blue. Like it did the whole. Full Monty that day. Every level I gave you had something to deal with that individual day. When you have that moment of astonishment where you can see these things before they happen and you know where they're going to key up on, where the highs and lows are going to form, where the setups are going to form, and all you got to do is wait for the time of day when it's going to form, there's nothing that you can use in terms of words to describe it. It's that moment of what feels like real magic it feels like all the planets aligned like everything finally makes sense and it's a weird epiphany that i still am always trying to find a way to articulate it and i i can't because none of the words i could string together won't even come close it feels like you can finally see it the thing that you don't even know what you're looking for which makes no sense, you listening to me right now, and I'm hearing my own words. <laughs> it, it doesn't reach far enough. It doesn't, because it, it gives you a sense of empowerment that when you experience it and you start living it and you can see it repeating all the time, if you communicate the level of confidence you have in it, you're going to sound arrogant too. You're going to. And at some point, you're not going to give a fuck what people think. Because it, it, you don't have time to to explain it. And at 50 years old, I don't have time to explain it, okay? I don't have a, a way of explaining it where you're going you're gonna to have to experience it yourself. And some of you have been experiencing it. Students that have gone through mentorship, they have experienced it. They make real fucking money. They don't give a shit whether you believe them or not. They don't give a fuck. They don't care. None of that matters. Their life is completely and permanently fucking changed for the positive. They don't give a rat's ass. Who's making videos about what? Who's talking about what? They don't give a shit. When you start making money, be honest now. 
text, no, not text, tweet me right now. Who, you know, who's going to be the one that gives a fuck what anybody else thinks when you start making bank? Name the person you're going to give a fuck about hearing from when you start making six figures a year. Who's, who's going to be the person that's going to make you feel bad about doing that? Is there anybody you can name? Because <laughs> chances are you're probably typing nobody. Yep, nobody. That's the person that's going to influence you. Because none of this is going to matter. Anybody's opinion about what you're doing when you're being successful matters not. And there's nothing wrong with living like that. Being successful is always going to have some measure of other people being angry that they couldn't do what you're doing. And now they've cultivated this mindset that if you can do it, you, ever, you owe everybody else a piece of it. Because it's not fair. Equality. Here's the equality. I'm giving it to you for fucking free. You all have the same advantages. So do it. Do it. But once you get there, don't be stingy with it. Help other people. Do something nice for other people. You know, I, I want to hear about that. I'm hoping that I've encouraged that type of mindset in all of you. And when you get to that point where you can afford to do things nice, you don't have to make a big show of it. And I have people that are building hospitals in other countries. You know, I have people that are building orphanages. You know, all these things, like that to me and my family, when we see that type of stuff, that's that's incredible. That's stuff that really matters. Not, I bought a fucking Lamborghini, man. I had to pay cash for it. And it's great. And eh, fuck off. Nobody cares about that. Lamborghinis are out of style. <laughs> okay. Bugatti, man. I want to be impressed. Show me a Bugatti. Buy, buy the first Bugatti. That's what I want. Because if you ain't got a Bugatti, I don't give a fuck about your car. So, in closing, we've covered a great deal of things, obviously, much more than you probably paid for. But uh, there are no refunds. And everything you're going to see this year will help solidify everything you've seen in videos from me over the years. But monthly goals are absolutely crucial to you developing. Because if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every single time. And if you're here to learn how to make money and you're not aiming for something in terms of monetary goal, if it's realistic, and I think 10% or less, and 10% is two and a half years minimum experience, consistently profitable minimum, two and a half years like that, then and only then would I even promote the idea of aiming for 10% a month. But prior to that, nah, just aim for three to 6%. The end of the first year, you should be going into your first full year, going into the second start of the new year. That should be a goal of 6% per month and accepting the fact that sometimes you won't, you won't hit it, but you won't be in a rush to try to get it before the end of the month. That's the difference. And that's also a growth that you'll have to go through that's uncomfortable. Because you want to be perfect. You want to hit your monthly goal every single month. And when you go into drawdown, you're going to feel like you want to make it back. Or worst case scenario, think, okay, my goal is 6%. And on January 1st of the new year, when I start as my second year in 2024, you have a goal of 6%. And say you only make 3.5%. Don't go into February trying to do the 6% plus the difference that you didn't make in January. Just accept the fact that you didn't hit it. Learn from that. Develop responsibility and discipline not to chase the money. You're sticking to a process. Are you going to be mad if you have a six-figure account, $250,000 funded account, and you made 3.5% in January, 6% in February, 4% in March, 1% in April, 6% the next three months after that, and then 2%, maybe break even on a few months the rest of the year. Is that a failure? Fuck no, it's not a failure. You will not go into a tailspin because you're not losing your mind about losing a trade. You're not in a rush to get it back. You're not trying to do an Olympic feat. You're doing realistic expectations, aiming for something that's logical. Think about what the industry teaches, 2% risk. That's too high. It's too high. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do that at all. You can do one 
1% or less than 1% and make all the money you'd ever fucking need. But the problem is you can't see it because you can't see consistency. Consistency doing the same thing. What's the same thing? Your multiplier. The very thing, that pattern that you look for all the time that you're going to place money behind. And the money management does the heavy lifting. How many Big Macs did McDonald's sell? Who the fuck knows? A lot of them, right? They make a Big Mac the same fucking way. They've been making them the same way forever. My mom used to eat them all the time. I don't eat McDonald's fucking food, but I don't even call it food. But that Big Mac is the same shit sandwich that it was back in the 70s when I was seeing it the first time as a young boy. They're not trying to reinvent some shit, okay? It's the Big Mac. When you're going into your trading, the same recipe, the same model, the same multiplier that McDonald's uses for their Big Mac sandwich, you're doing that with your setup. You're not trying to make a fucking Big Mac a Whopper, okay? You're not trying to make it a fucking, you know, something other than what it is. And you're looking for it to appear in your chart. And when it's there, you don't think about it. You just engage it. You do it the same way every single time. You manage it the same way every single time. Done. The same measure of percent in terms of risk you're putting on the trade each time is the same. As your equity goes up, you're going to be risking more money, but percentage-wise, it's the same amount of risk per equity. That's the benefit of having money management do the heavy lifting. You're doing the same thing all the time. And as the money goes up, the effort and results are compounded because of more equity and more leverage being placed behind the trade. But you're not increasing it exponentially in terms of percentage per risk. It's just the amount of equity being allocated in that percentage. As equity goes up, your leverage will be going up. So your position size will be increasing, but the measure of risk is never increasing. Monetarily it is, but percentage-wise, it's not increasing. You have a fixed rate of risk percentage-wise. And as you draw down when you have losing trades, then you start scaling it back. And that's the reason why you want to have it like 1% to three quarters of 1% because that gives you framework to do what when you have a losing trade? Cut your position in half. Now, you can go in with the lowest level of leverage and start there. There's nothing wrong with that either, but I like to have a little bit of a horse in a race. And you know, one percent, three quarters of one percent, I think is is doable. It's not ex you know, exposing you to obscene amount of risk, but you can still can blow your account doing that over and over and over again, losing control, having a number of, of trades that you're willing to take in a day, and knowing when to stop. Like they're all rules that you have to have. And that's all part of what makes your multiplier, your setup, your pattern, your unique model. There's, there's things you have to bring to it, not just simply, oh, I'm looking for fair value gap after a shift to market structure and looking for you know a discount or a premium array to, to, to attack. Okay, well, what are you going to risk on your trade? And what happens if you take a loss on that trade? How are you going to engage? When will you stop? See, when I go into live streams, you know, I know we were supposed to stop talking, right? Uh, I'm awake, so I'm still talking. When I'm on live streams and I get a chance to ask the person that's doing the live stream, I ask questions like this. I'm like, you know, what what tells you when to stop? Like, when do you pull the plug on your trading for the day? Is there a certain amount of money that you aim for once you hit it, you're done? Is there a certain number of losing trades or a percentage of equity you are willing to absorb? Or how many losing transactions do you have before you call it quits? Um, if you make money in the morning, do you trade in the afternoon or vice versa? Like I ask this of anyone that allows me to be able to comment. And some of these fucking live streamers are little bitches because they see me in there. Okay. Wyland. Okay. You won't answer any of my, my questions. And I'm being sincere. I'm, I'm a part of your audience. <laughs> okay. And you won't answer my questions. It takes your moderators to, uh, to say what I said. Then you'll respond to them. But whatever. But I ask the same type of questions. Because I'm interested in the way the trader thinks. I could give two fucks what they use to get in because 90% of the time what they're doing is, is asinine shit. They're, they're either chasing the market, le legitimately chasing it, or they're just flat out wrong. 
but I like listening to their approach to how they internalize it. What what causes the wrestling matches internally? Because that's where everybody fails. And I like listening to their answers. And and for the most part, they all have the same retail responses. You know, they just trust they just trust their gut. Um, they you know they when they feel the pressure of it and they just can't handle it anymore, then they stop. To me, that's bullshit. You have to have it written out. I'm going to take a losing trade once in the morning. And then if I have a losing trade in the morning, I'll go one more time. If I lose again in the morning session, there is no afternoon session. That's it. We're done. Because I'm at, I'm at my two loss in the same session. And that means I'm probably going to be going in bitter and sore and wanting to prove something. And I want to get it all back in the afternoon. So therefore, do what? Just take it home. Go in there tomorrow and trade again. That's why I'm teaching you that way. In time, you'll know when you can go in the afternoon and correct that. But you don't know what that's like when you're brand new. You're impulsive. You have no idea what you're doing. And I have to be careful what I was going to say because another person I like watching would probably be offended about what I'm going to say and it wouldn't even have anything to do with them. So I'll hold that thought for a different conversation. But you have to know what causes you to say, I'm not doing it. If you take a losing trade in the morning and you don't take a second trade at all, then you can go in the afternoon trying to just take some of the loss away. You're not trying to get it all back. You're not trying to double the loss into a gain. These are all rules that have to be outlined, written, not, well, you know, I'll, I'll use that today because it feels like I should do it. No, you have to be rigid with these rules. Big Macs are not fucking made with chicken strips, okay? It's the same wannabe beef in those fucking pieces of bread, lettuce, and Thousand Island sauce they call special sauce, <laughs> okay? That's a Big Mac. So they're doing it the same way all the time. Sometimes the Big Mac you get isn't fit for eating. It's just like the fucking trade sometimes. You're going to get into it, and it could be worth having. It's the way it is. Sometimes you just you don't get what you paid for. And you get a bad result. Doesn't mean Big Macs are going to sell in the future. There's going to be lots of people that want Big Macs. And just like that model that you're following, once you identify what it is that you're going to be following, you're going to still trust it. Even though it gives you once in a while lackluster or subpar results. And that is a learning curve that some of you aren't prepared for. You want it to be perfect. You want it to be painless. You want it to have no adversities coming through. Walking through the door, and it's just right to the penthouse. Fuck that. No, nobody has that experience. Nobody has have ever had that experience. And you're not going to be the one that gets it. Even if I was to sit down with you personally and trade live right next to you, you still would have adversities. You're going to have uncomfortable periods where you're not going to know. Like, think about it. When I'm doing certain things in the videos, like, how did you know this? And how did you do? And I'm expecting you to talk about, hey, that entry pattern was framed on this logic here, and your stop loss was framed on that. And how'd you get to that target? You're worrying about other shit that's the least important thing. Why didn't you use that fairway gap versus this one? When that question you're asking is actually answered in the 2022 commentaries, you got to get past the first couple videos, folks. You got to watch them all. That's why I put it in there. So it's not for a lack of you know trying. I, I put the information in the in the lectures, but you have to watch them. And, and not just listen to them. You got to take notes and then go and say, okay, what he said about the market doing these certain things. Let me see if I can go and see it. And boom, there you'll see it. And then it's now understood. You don't need to watch the videos 15 times to get the, the, the real flavor of what I'm trying to communicate. You'll see what it is and then you won't need to go back to that topic anymore. But anyway, I'm quite certain my mom, my mom, <laughs> my, uh, my wife is, flipping out down there and my children probably asked my mom, their mother rather. Dad's been up here a long time. Yes, I have. I've had a lot of time, a lot of fun tonight. 
and I'm feeling much better. And I've thoroughly enjoyed having this uh, discussion with you. It maybe not so much answered the, the nuts and bolts of what it is that you should do, because if you're leaving this discussion, feeling like 25%, 30% a month is doable consistently, I'm going to argue that with you. Because if you're starting out just now and you think that's a goal for you to be trying to go for right away, don't. Don't do that. Especially if you finally arrive at a point where you're funded and you have access to be able to take money from a company that makes it available to you. Be comfortable with doing the least in the beginning because it's so easy to ruin it for yourself. And it's such a hard thing to climb back out of. It's much easier to defer instant gratification trying to do a lottery win or a big windfall victory. Because once you suffer that, it stays with you. It's something that will plague every decision you ever make going forward. I can't tell you how many times when I put a trade on, as soon as I push the button, sometimes I'll have a flashback of something I did in another market decades ago. And I wasn't even thinking about that market or that even remotely happening in, in recent weeks, days, or months. But something triggers a memory, and I'm like, oh, shit. And it causes me to second guess something, which causes me to get slippage on, on the position entry. That's normal. Like, that's a normal thing. But when I first started encountering that, I felt like there was something wrong with me. No, it's just I have a lot of experience. And because I was learning to do this improperly, because I didn't have a mentor sitting down with me in the beginning. You know, the good Lord himself was the one that was giving me the tenacity to stick with this and guide me through all the, the turmoil. But I didn't have, like, this guy like you got right now that's bloviating on about what you should and shouldn't do. And it's hard to climb out of that, well, pit once you place yourself there, even if it's a small little drawdown. There isn't enough encouragement to fix that stain that puts on your career as a trader because you all want to walk through with you know, perfect linen, no soil, no stains, no tears in your garments. That's not going to happen. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get a black eye, a deviated septum, broken ribs, might lose a couple teeth. You're going to lose some hair. It's going to gray. You know, you're going to have all kinds of struggles the longer you do this. And it's all part of it. And you got to know what you're getting involved in because it's not all peaches and cream here. You have to be comfortable with, I'm losing sometimes. And that's fucking fun. Because it's not taking me out. I'm going to win. Every time I have a, a losing trade, the next trade, I'm trying to be even more precise with my entry and more precise with my exit. And I'm doing it with less risk. And I turn it into a way of personal victory, doing exactly what I'm supposed to do within the rules and the context of how I'm trading. And if you do that, guess what it does for you? as a byproduct, it prevents you from going lunacy, like losing your mind, trying to get it back all right away. You won't have any anxiety about forcing yourself and being correct and trying to repair the drawdown right away. And here's the other thing. You won't regret not catching the big windfall wins. Think about how many times have you watched me do a trade or watched the market tear off and you can see it in hindsight. Oh, if I would have just been there, I could have done that. See, that's a problem for a new trader. That's a huge, huge problem. Only recently in the last, I don't know, maybe eight years or so, fear of missing out, FOMO, has you know, made its way to the, the vocabulary of a new startup trader. When we were coming up in the 90s and even before me, <clears throat> folks would uh, make no mention of fearing missing a move. 
we were all scared shitless. Like we were afraid to get in the markets because we were told what? Everybody loses their ass in the commodity markets. Don't trade commodities. Well, you know me. You say, don't step on the grass. I'm going to moonwalk across that shit. So I jumped in there fearless and I'm going to do whatever I got to do to make money and then lost my ass right away. So I had to learn how to trade. You are going to fear missing out on all these moves until you adopt a model and you execute and operate only in the context and rules and parameters of that model. When you do that, you will, number one, be sober-minded about how making money is the number one common denominator while you're doing what you're doing. You're not in here to try to impress anybody. You're here to make fucking money. That's it. You got bills to pay. You have a lifestyle you're trying to flesh out for you and your family. There's no shame in that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And having lots of money, that's not evil. The love of money is the root of evil. Not having a lot of money is evil. That's bullshit. That's that's a twisting of it. So having a lot of money is wonderful because you can do lots of things with money with the right mindset and heart. You can do a lot of good things for other people. But if you don't have a model, you will look at moves, tear off, and you not being a part of that move will make you do what? Regret, chase, and have remorse for not having been a part of it. And that fear of missing out on the next one will drive you crazy. But now if you have a model that tells you, I'm engaging, I'm only going to get this many points during this session. Once I get it, I'm stopping. I'm closing my fucking charts. I'll come back in the afternoon if my model says I can. If it says no, I close it and I come back the next day. And that makes you money. And you're not worrying about anything else outside of that because you're keeping your focus on following the fucking rules. If you follow the rules when you're driving your car and you follow all the laws, you don't speed, you stay on your right side of the fucking road and the next person does the same way. And as long as there's no weather, issue, chances are you're probably going to arrive in one piece. Change any of those circumstances and guess what you've invited? Chaos. And chaos likes to come in there in, in a, a, a astonishing manner. <laughs> Sometimes much more expensive than you've ever imagined it would be. And yes, the same thing you'll get in your trading. If you open yourself up to things that your parameters and your rules are meant to protect you from what's it protecting you from yourself see the broker isn't going to do anything to you the market is not going to do anything to you outside of what you allow it can't take anything from you if you don't enter the trade it can't take more money from you than you've allowed it to through leverage and your stop placement. Your broker can't make you put the trade on and your broker can't make you take the trade off unless it margins you out. So who's really running this shit? You are. But everybody, when they first start, they like to find the fault with somebody else. Oh, this guy taught me bullshit. This guy didn't teach me this way. Oh, my broker didn't let me do this, and I did that, and I did this. No. Own it. You fucked up. It's a learning experience. Grow from it. How do you present a, a track record of consistency without having a rule-based model? I don't understand that because I'm not impressed with somebody just winging it, putting trades on sometimes with a stop loss, sometimes not, and only coming out of drawdown when you have the highest level of contracts you can afford, even if it's real account. That to me is not skill. That's just somebody that's just trying to dig their way out of a pit. And that's the extreme of it. And you don't want to open yourself up to any of those types of things because they're avoidable, number one. And it's all rooted in public image, whether it be your friends and family and coworkers or the circle on you on your uh, social media platforms, whether it be Twitter, Instagram, 
Discord, Telegram, whatever the hell it is, you know, those people are not going to increase your bottom line. They're not. But guess what they can do? They can affect it adversely because they're going to influence you into making you feel like you didn't do enough, you didn't impress them, you didn't have enough size on that position to warrant a like or a comment from somebody or a reaction from someone. If everything you're doing in your trades is geared at trying to get public acceptance or my acceptance by a like or a retweet or something to that effect, you're doing it wrong. It doesn't matter what I think or anybody else thinks. Did you follow your rules? Did your model deliver like you expected it to do? Did you manage risk impeccably? If you've done that, do the same thing the next time. And that's all that fucking matters. That's it. That's all this is. That's all trading is. You're keeping the bullshit out. You're not letting toxicity come in, whether it be from your friends and family, co-workers, or social media. See, social media is that fucking relative that comes to the fucking Christmas party and shit that you know damn well. Every time they come there, they're drunk, they're disorganized, they're dysfunctional. They bring all the bullshit. They're the black cloud that comes in there. And every horror story that can be talked about, they're the one bringing it. And you feel like they've sucked the life out of the entire experience. That's what social media is. It's the, the unwanted cousin that you didn't want to have show up at fucking Thanksgiving. That's what social media is. And you all love them. You keep signing into it, loving it, because you're addicted to that drama. You're addicted to that bullshit. And none of that's going to make you money. None of it. It'll distract you. You'll miss trades. You'll worry about bullshit. And the whole time, the market just presented something that you just missed. So you're going to have to be a, a guard of your attention. Where, who are you giving your time to? Are you giving your time to someone that's actively pursuing a better outcome for you? Or are you watching somebody that's trying to sell something to hopefully get money out of your pocket into theirs? Have you listened to other people pour themselves into you like you're getting right now <laughs> for free? And this is real world shit. Like I've lived all this stuff. Or are you getting a sales pitch later on? A coupon code, some horseshit, something that you don't need. Okay. You only need the open, high, low, and close. That's it. Some logic as to why it should run to a high or a low or a fair value gap above the price or below the price. Folks, that's it. That's the, that's the only four outcomes. If the market's going to move, that's it. If it's not doing that, guess what it's doing? It's consolidating. So now let's strip it down. Does it want to go higher? How do we know that? Did it take sell stops recently? And is the weekly chart likely to expand on some higher time frame level? If it is, and those criteria has been there, then you wait for a time. 8.30 when news comes out, or you wait for 9.30 equities open. And you look for evidence of displacement to show you that it wants to go there. Once it does that, it's a shift in market structure. Okay, great. Use your fair value gap. Go on and go and buy it. Put your stop loss where I taught you, right below the low. And then if you get stopped out, if you're going to take another trade, half of the leverage that you used before. What are you going to aim for? A short-term high if you're bullish or a fair value gap above the market price that you are entering at? Once you get there, whatever that target is that you're aiming for, 75 to 80% of your position needs to be off. Done. Now, that's how you can do this model where you're aiming for several handles. Once you bank that, then leave a little portion on to see if you can get a runner. And many times you're going to find out that that smaller portion pays for in full some of your losing trades. So it allows you to smooth out all those imperfections in your performance. And that's something that you're going to want to have as a trader, something that helps you weather all that uh, 
normalcy in trading where you think it's a straight vertical line of everybody's making money you're finding out that there's an up and down to this sometimes and you need to be able to keep that down slope the drawdown managed so it's not just managing profitable trades you want to manage your losing trades when you go into a losing series of of incorrect trades and you're going to have it you got to be able to reduce the amount of leverage on your trades so that way when you're in a losing series of trades you're reducing the next trade you take it's half of what you put on in terms of leverage so if you took a, a like for instance you see me start with many times six contracts that's 300 dollars per point in the s p and then my next partial unless i'm really aggressive and i know i'm on side i'll go from six to three contracts on my next uh, pyramid and then from three down to one if i'm really aggressive i know i'm on side that means i know i'm on the right side of the marketplace i have all the things i look for that would cause me to be bullish I'm going to go in with six contracts and then my next partial will be five and then my next partial going in will be four three two one that's pillaring okay a pyramid is where i start with the largest portion first and then i work my way down splitting it in half each time that's my normal pyramiding if i know i'm on side and i know have everything in my favor that's going to go up i will go in with six five four three two one and then many times, if I catch something else and it gives me something else that I can uh, add another one on, I'll go one more single after that. And that's usually it. So if that's your working base of what your like your average multiplier is, like that's like that's my go-to. If I can't put a trade on with that type of gearing, then I'm probably not in a high probability setup. So I'll just do something with like four or three contracts and no pyramiding. I'll just do partials as it lets me. So you'll see those examples when I'm doing, you know, the live explanations. I'll say, okay, this is a trade where I would have done six here. I'm going to say what I would do. I'm not going to push the button. So that way you can clearly see I am not front running anything, not even in a demo, not nothing. I'm going to explain the logic of what I'm looking for, why it should be done this way, and that way you see it. Somebody is still going to bitch and complain that you're not trading ICT, but I'm still going to call it to the fucking degree of perfection, and they're, it's going to, they're going to miss the whole point of doing it. Don't be that stupid person, okay? Don't be a fucking Carl. There's no Employee of the Week award around here. But I think that's going to be it tonight. So I'm going to close this one, and hopefully you got something out of it. If not, I hope I entertained you for the time we've been together. I'm trying to see what I got here. Hold on one second. It's one o'clock in the morning. I've been going for four hours. It feels like I just fucking started. You want to go for four more hours? I can go for four more hours. <laughs> Some of your work. Like, this motherfucker ain't stopped talking yet. No, I, I don't. I don't stop talking unless I'm sleeping. But anyway, I had a lot of fun tonight. And I feel so much better. And I'm hoping that you got something from this in terms of inspiration and realistic approach to setting monthly goals, why you should do it, and why you shouldn't do other things. And I tossed a lot of other stuff in here for no extra charge. And I don't know when I'm going to do the next one. I wasn't really planning on doing any of these in 2023 but you know how that works with me whatever i say you know you're always gonna get more than what you're expected to get so anyway tomorrow turn your charts on at 10 o'clock look for a, a one or five minute short-term high or low and study that for a liquidity run and look for five handles don't start your charts or open them up before 10 o'clock because you're going to be doing this exercise Monday through Friday of next week. And I'm going to give you other things that you got to start doing. But I want you to just spend time doing that. Don't do any demos tomorrow. You're just paper trading or not paper trading. You're, you're tape reading. No paper trading. No demo trading. No live trading. Okay. Just observe. But only look at the market right at 10 o'clock. And only look to 1045. You should find something between 10 and, and 45. One little stop hunt, look for five handles. If you don't get it, if you can't see it in real time, just after the fact, after it happens and you can see it for what it really is then, log it, put that in your journal 
and you'll see what I can do with that with your learning the following week, okay? And all of this will help frame tape reading and understanding how to find setups. And it's applicable to higher time frame charts. Don't think that this only works on these smaller time frames. It doesn't. It works on all time frames. But you have you have to lot the logic that I'm going to share with you, you know, as we go through this year. Okay. That's gonna be it. I'll touch base with you, I'm sure, tomorrow by way of Twitter. Tickle on your Twitter. And until I do that, be safe.